America's best idea was established in 1916. With the establishment came founding principles of preserving the parks for the enjoyment of future generations. Water resources in parks are important for their scenic beauty, wildlife habitat, and recreational opportunities. Many lakes and ponds in national parks are formed by man-made dams. We have been entrusted to protect people and park resources from the hazards of these dams. Federal, department, and MPS policies require us to have safe dams. History has shown that dams can fail and cause tremendous loss of life and property. The National Park Service experienced a tragic dam failure in 1982. Lawn Lake stood at treeline and at almost 11,000 feet above sea level. The dam was built in 1903 to increase the storage of the high mountain lake. The dam was about 560 feet long and 26 feet high. There were three campsites on the trail up to the lake and one camping area at the lake itself. People enjoyed the scenic beauty of the lake. In the early morning hours of July 15, 1982, one camper recalled, At two in the morning I awoke and I heard a roar. At the time I assumed it was just the wind. However, I thought it strange that the tent was not fluttering. It wasn't the wind. Seepage was accelerating and creating a hole through the dam, and at approximately 5 a.m., the dam gave way. Rapidly, nearly 700 acre feet of water, enough to fill a sports stadium three times, drained in about an hour. The water rushed through the 97 foot wide breach. The maximum flow was the same as the volume of 18,000 basketballs passing every second. The water began flowing down the steep, roaring river. Before the flood, the Roaring River was so highly vegetated it could not be seen from the air. The 25-foot high dam failure flood tore into the riverbed and took trees, rocks, and everything else in its path. Down it flowed toward three campsites. At the Ypsilon campsite, a man recalled, At about 6.20 in the morning, all in our party were awakened by a loud tree-breaking thunder. By the time we looked out our tents, the first surge of water was 50 feet away, sending trees crashing downward along with tons of earth and boulders. Water and debris reached our tent as we scrambled uphill. In steep sections, the erosion was over 50 feet deep, and in flatter areas, the flood made deposits up to 500 feet wide. As the flood neared the Roaring River campsite, one camper was up making coffee. I started to hear a sound like an airplane. Also, there were loud booms. And it got louder and louder. I got suspicious and started to look upstream. I saw trees crashing over and a wall of water coming down. I started to run as fast as I could for high ground. There was a deafening roar. I fell and got up and kept running. I stood on high ground and called out to my campmate and watched it wipe out our campsite. It knocked everything in its path, and my partner didn't stand a chance. The 12,000 cubic foot per second flood made one final turn, and made its final 500 foot descent to the Horseshoe Valley. The flood dropped its load of trees and rock, creating an alluvial fan, 42 acres in size, and up to 44 feet deep. One rock moved 
by the flood was estimated to weigh 452 tons. At 6.15 a.m., Mr. Stephen Gillette was driving his truck into Horseshoe Park to empty the trash barrels at the Lawn Lake Trailhead. I can hardly wait to get there because it's usually a very quiet place of solitude. And as I arrive, I get out of the truck and I hesitate. I hear what I think is a plane crashing. I look up the hill. I see a ponderosa pine doing a loop-de-loop -loop in the air. I immediately go back to my truck, put it in reverse, wanting to get to the emergency telephone at the Lawn Lake Trailhead to alert the National Park. On my way to the trailhead, I'm almost there. I see an early riser tourist on his way to the Indo Valley area. I think, oh my, I must block the road. I block the road, I get out, I run to the telephone. I call headquarters and let them know that I believe now that the dam has broken. Mr. Gillette's call started the warning and evacuation of the entire downstream area, including a small dam downstream, a campground, cottages along the river, and the town of Estes Park. Five minutes later, a park ranger arrived and met Mr. Gillette on the Fall River Bridge. They saw the flood coming toward them. The leading edge was a hundred yards wide wall of logs and other debris, about six feet high, was coming at them. The water reached the road and began rising. Mr. Gillette and the ranger left the bridge just as the flood front quickly widened and overtopped the road. The bridge collapsed. The dam failure floodwaters began filling the east end of Horseshoe Park. Mr. Gillette stopped at an overlook and recalled later that it looked like an ocean. By this time, Horseshoe Park is filling up, and I think, I need to get back to Estes Park. I do that. I get back down, get through town to where our business is located before the water hits downtown Estes Park. Observers thought that the wide meadow had soaked up the flood like a sponge and that the worst part was over. But the worst was not over. The water was still moving and began to flow east out of Horseshoe Park. Cascade Reservoir lied just downstream from Horseshoe Park. At 7 a.m., the flood began pouring into the reservoir. At 7.15, there was a rapid rise in the water level behind the 17-foot-high Cascade Dam. Ten minutes later, people staying at the Cascade Cottages witnessed the flood overtopping the concrete dam. At the peak, over four feet of water was rushing over the crest of the dam. After 17 minutes of overtopping, the outlet control house began to break away. The near side of the dam rotated forward the entire structure began to lean downstream. Then the dam finally toppled over. The surge from the failure more than doubled the flood to 16,000 cubic feet per second. The small reservoir quickly emptied, sending a new surge of water downstream. While the dam was overtopping, a ranger at the scene decided to drive to the Aspen Glen campground to confirm that the 275 campers had fully evacuated. The ranger recalled. We proceeded as quickly as possible to the Aspen Glen area, reaching the Fall River at approximately 7.33 in the morning. The floodwaters were, at that time, over the road. I informed dispatch that we couldn't get into the campground. At approximately 7.45, I detected a noticeable increase in the noise of the flood and observed two large trees crack and fall about 100 yards upstream. I immediately returned to my vehicle and drove about 50 yards northward on the road. I observed that the flood had increased to twice the width in less than 30 seconds. If I had not moved my vehicle, I would have been washed away. 
At 7.48, I informed dispatch that the crest of the Cascade Dam flood had passed by my location and that the Aspen Glen campground was isolated. The flood charged toward the campground. All of the campers near the river had evacuated. But two campers went back over this bridge to retrieve camping gear. The flood rapidly increased in size and they were swept away. The flood filled stock ponds at a state fish hatchery, destroying 90,000 fish. Local officials raced ahead of the flood to warn people in cottages and motels. Buildings were knocked off their foundations. Broadcasts from the local KSIR radio station and its on-the-scene reporters helped to inform and evacuate people. It is a very serious situation. If you are in the uh, Fall River Trailer Park, please get out of that area immediately. And there's a lot of debris coming down river right now. It's crazy. It's brown, murky. Every time it hits a lamp pole, it uh, does a uh, rooster tail type of effect. There's a tremendous amount of debris that's associated with all this water. There are propane tanks which have been broken loose. These propane tanks apparently still are full, and it is possible to see the propane vapors evaporating. As the flood began to recede, officers forded the waters after hearing reports of people trapped in a building. Fortunately, no one in town lost their lives. Downstream of the town, the Fall River floodwaters entered Lake Estes. Logs and debris floated on the surface. Olympus Dam contained the flood. By 9.30 a.m., the critical emergency had passed. 177 businesses were inundated, representing three-quarters of the businesses in Estes Park. Damages totaled $31 million, and the town was declared a federal disaster area. And most tragically, three lives were lost. Even after 30 years, the after effects of the Lawn Lake Dam failure are still very evident on the park's landscape. Today, how do we keep dams from failing in the national parks and causing destruction like the Lawn Lake Dam failure? First, we keep an inventory of all dams. We also inventory dams we don't own, whose failure would harm park resources or people downstream. Secondly, for the dams we own, we assign Park Service staff as dam tenders. This assignment is critically important. Dam tenders receive training, routinely monitor the dams, and look for seepage, cracks, or other problems. Thirdly, we maintain the dams. We also have expert engineers examine and review the risks of our dams. When risks exceed guidelines, we repair the dams. Should a dam fail, we have emergency action plans to respond and alert public safety officials to warn and evacuate people downstream. We also remove dams that no longer serve the purposes of the parks. Dams and their reservoirs benefit the parks. However, dams hold back a powerful force that, when unleashed, can destroy park resources and threaten lives. Managing the risks of dams is an important responsibility we share.